you have your Bibles, we'll open to Daniel chapter number 2 this morning. Daniel chapter number 2. Excited to be back here in the pulpit preaching again this morning as we look at the next part in Daniel's uh, life that we know about, all right? Uh, remember chapter 1 was where Daniel and his three friends stood against the, uh, the, the pagan king's diet and God blessed them ten times. All right, they were ten times smarter, ten times healthier, ten times better than the king's men. And so Daniel has withstood a tremendous test in life. Daniel and his three friends, of course, did not grow up in Babylon. They were born in Jerusalem or around that area. And because of wickedness and turning against God, the pagan king came and carried, uh, along with others, these, these boys away. They're in a strange land with a strange king, with strange God, and yet their own God, they worshipped the God of the universe. It did not change their God. They chose to say this, I believe God. Can you say that with me? They chose to believe this, I believe God. What I'm submitting to us each week throughout this year, that we will choose to believe God. Not just in words, but in actions. Right, Not just in lip service, but with our life. And I love the fact that David repeatedly chooses to believe God. You see, sometimes in life, after we travel through one particular test or one particular trial, we think we deserve a break. God just brought us through a hard time, and maybe we got to see, like Daniel, the, the victory. We got to see the victory. Daniel got to see the victory. And now we think, well, boy, that was tough. Now I can sit back and I can relax. We're going to find out in Daniel chapter 2 that not very long after Daniel chapter 1 comes Daniel chapter 2. And not very long after this first trial in Daniel's life as far as leaving the country and standing for God, he's going to be tested again. We're going to see how his faith in God is. See, this chapter involves a dream. Involves a dream. Involves a hard dream and impossible circumstances. I like Daniel chapter 2 because we can identify with hard circumstances. Can we not? Hard circumstances, sometimes from the doctor, sometimes from a bill, sometimes from internal relationally, uh, but hard circumstances. But sometimes... We are faced with what we would deem to be impossible circumstances. Things that have no human way of being solved. And guess what our God likes to do? Can I help you here? God likes to overcome impossible circumstances. You see, when they're hard, we can sometimes in our own strength work through hard circumstances. But we can't do anything with the impossible. And in this account Daniel chapter 2 we're going to find out that there's nothing that Daniel can do except choose to believe God that's a great place to be Lord thank you for loving us thank you for this time this morning Lord I pray you'd help me Lord help me to say those things that are right and true Lord help me to say those things that will be helpful in our lives Lord there's no doubt some needs this morning Lord as we see this account of Daniel and how he chose to put his faith and trust in you Lord, may our hearts be challenged and touched. Lord, I pray for someone who may be today going through what they deem to be an impossible circumstance. Lord, I pray that you would help them to look to you. Lord, I pray that in your power, in your might, in your wisdom and riches, you would solve that. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. In Daniel chapter 2, the Bible says, and in the second year, in the second year, of the reign Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. We begin the chapter with this kind of account of what's happening, and it's where Nebuchadnezzar is dreaming some dreams. Now, these are not dreams like goals or visions. They asked a, a survey of 500 plus adults, U.S. adults, what their value in their dream home would be. Now, what do you think 500 adults would say about their dream things, their dream items, and their dream homes? 
These are what they said in this order, or, or, or not in this order, that, that some 2% said they would love luxury appointments like gold-plated faucets. Is that in your dream home? It's not in my dream home, no. How about this? 12% said they wanted high-tech features like security cameras, surround sound, and smart home things. 12%. Is that in your dream home? All right, some people. Here's one. 24% said this, a bathroom connected to every room. All right, now, now you're walking up. Now, now you're walking in my park right now. Uh, see, I, 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 am, I am young enough to remember our first house, okay? It wasn't that long ago. We had Uno bathroom. That's one, all right? Puerto Rican bring some Spanish in this morning, all right? One bathroom, which was fine until we were potty training with the kids. Then one bathroom was kind of... Now, some of you older folks are going to come to me after church. You're like, listen, you won't believe it. In our house, when we grew up, we had 35 people in an outhouse. Okay, save me the stories. I already know about it. It was 35, it'll be 40 next week. I'm not worried. I understand that. It is possible. But for heaven's sake, we live in 2020, so we can have one and a half bathrooms. Okay, 24% they said they want a bathroom connected to every room. But 63% of all people in the dream for their dream home, this is what they said <laughs> boggles my mind what, 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 what the highest value on this survey was. Here it is, ready? Built in storage. They want a closet. A closet in their house is mind blowing. 63% for a closet. Well, we're not talking about those kind of dreams this morning. We're talking about actual dreams. And Nebuchadnezzar had some dreams like you fall asleep while I'm preaching, have a dream. Okay, like that kind of dream. That kind of dream. Now, they tell me that everyone dreams at night. So they tell me. I don't know how you prove that or not. And you only, I guess, remember the dream if you wake up during the dream. All right, that's, that is what they say. I don't know how you prove that or not, or if you really dream or not. Maybe it's based on brain activity while someone's asleep. But, but Nebuchadnezzar has some dreams, and these dreams troubled him. The first thing I see is some agitation of the king. Now, this is the background of an impossible circumstance, understand. And understand that as we're laying the groundwork for this impossible circumstance, the king, all right, the one who has the ultimate power in that kingdom is now agitated. He is now concerned. He now has issues. Right? This is not good when the man who can control your life for life and death is now upset. He's agitated and these dreams have troubled him. Now understand, I need to pause here real quick. Dreams nowadays, I believe biblically, do not hold any, any real meaning in your life. All right, now, now get this, all right? This is a, a, a side note because this is important. In Bible times, dreams held a lot of value at times. God often, or throughout the Bible, revealed certain things through dreams. When someone was asleep, all right, he would reveal himself to them through dreams, through Jacob, through Joseph, now through Nebuchadnezzar. This was not uncommon. Since we have the Bible, God does not reveal himself that way. This is important because I don't want you, all right, to, to come up to me tomorrow or call me Tuesday and say, listen, Pastor, I had this dream. What does it mean? Easy. Don't eat pickles before you go to bed. That's what it means. All right? God does not reveal himself like that. Now, he can, but he now chooses to reveal in his word. We have, we have the Word of God. We don't need dreams any longer. But in Bible times, dreams were very, very significant. I read this little story. A woman was taking an afternoon nap on New Year's Eve before the festivities. After she woke up, she confided to her husband, I just dreamed that you gave me a diamond ring for a New Year's present. What do you think it all means? Aha. You'll know tonight, grinned her husband, smiling broadly. At midnight, as the new year was chiming, the man approached his wife and handed her a small package. Delighted and excited, she tore it open, and inside was a book entitled The Meaning of Dreams. <laughs> That's terrible. He probably got another book, The Meaning of Silence. <laughs> dreams. Nebuchadnezzar had some dreams, and they really bothered him. You know, they can still bother people today. 
In fact, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but like Pastor said, you listen better if I don't tell you this. Yesterday, my wife was sharing a dream that she was bothered when she woke up. And in this dream, uh, she had a scary dream, and it, it affected her when she woke up, woke up in the morning. I, I need to tell you something, though, that I do not like hearing about the dreams you dreamed at night. I've never enjoyed this, okay? For all my 17 years plus here at First Baptist Church, you can ask the teenage boys who played soccer for me, I do not like hearing these about dreams. This is what normally happens, right? Someone comes like, listen, <laughs> and they're laughing. Like, you were in my dream last night. First of all, that disturbs me. I don't want to be in your dream. I don't care who you are. <laughs> but they're usually laughing. Oh, it was so funny. Okay. And they proceed to tell you, okay, you were walking down the road. <laughs> and they can't even finish the story, right? And then, <laughs> then you like, you jumped. Great. That's hilarious. <laughs> A little courtesy laugh. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I guess you had to be there. No, I don't want to be there in your dream. Okay. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care about your dream. But, but since you're a captive audience... I actually had a nightmare the other night. You say, what kind of nightmares do pastors have? I will tell you. In my nightmare, Brother Sturgeon, it was 11.55 Sunday morning, and the song service was still going on. I hadn't got to preach yet. And I was trying to figure out how I'm going to preach in the next five minutes or ten minutes. See what scares pastors of not being able to preach. Well, don't be, don't be worried, all right? I have plenty of time today. Nebuchadnezzar, though, had some dreams, and they scared him. They scared him so, so much, the Bible says, and his sleep break from him. It left him. Nebuchadnezzar was stuck wide awake. He says, I dreamed something, and it left you. It left him almost like in cold sweat and chills. He's agitated. He's got some problems. Boy, I don't know what to do. So he does what any king would do. In verse number two, he calls for some smart people. He makes, I would say, an astounding request from the king. Verse number two, that the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans. He called everybody he could call to help him with his problem. Okay, kind of like we do, right? We will find the answer. We'll pull out all the stops. We'll make this thing happen. He called them all, and he called for them to show the king his dreams. So they came, and they stood before the king. It was an urgent request that they received. I wonder if it was even almost middle of the night. Who knows? But he's so bothered. He's, listen, get everybody out of bed. Get everybody over here. I want the Chaldeans, and I want the astrologers, and I, and I want all the wise people, and anybody who thinks they're wise, and someone who used to be wise. Get them all before me. I've got to figure out what's going on in my head. It was an urgent request, but it was an unusual request. Verse number three, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream. Great, thanks king. I've dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. At first, as he makes this request, it seems kind of obvious. Well, great king. This is what we're here for. We're your learned men. We're the wisest men in the country. You call this here because we are experts in this field of dreams. And you have problems, we have solutions. You have needs, we have help. So, King, we are here to help you. And, in fact, that's basically what they say uh, in verse number 4. They speak the Chaldeans to the king. O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation. Can you hear the Chaldeans with a little bit of pompous arrogancy? Oh, king, don't worry. Oh, we thought this was a problem. There's no problem here. Hey, king, you just tell us the dream, and, and, and we'll show you what it means. You'll get some sleep tonight. You'll be happy. We'll be happy. But the request takes a turn. The, the request and it becomes a little uh, unusual now. Because to tell a dream, listen, if you want to know what your dream means, I can make up something for you, right? Oh, oh, you dreamed about me walking down the street. Well, that means, all right, that means that you're going to go down to a dock and there's going to be a yacht there. You need to buy me the new yacht. That's what your dream means. I, I can make up interpretations. That's what these Chaldeans were doing. They're making up interpretations. Oh, king, we can, we can do that. But the, but the request takes an unusual twist in verse number five where the king says, answer and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. 
If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. <laughs> the king makes an unthinkable request. The Chaldeans are no doubt saying, they're saying, don't worry, a little pompous and arrogant. And then the king says, no, 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 you don't understand, gentlemen. I can't remember my dream. So I want you to tell me what I dreamed and tell me what it means. And if you can't, you will all die. Well, well what kind of request is this? They go on the next few verses, about the next six verses, and I'll give you a synopsis. They say again, if you tell us what it is, we'll tell you what it means. The king repeats himself, if you don't tell me, you will all die. They repeat themselves again, if you tell us what it means, we'll tell you the interpretation. He repeats himself again, if you don't tell me, you will die. And then they say this, king, there is no one on earth that can do this thing. You know what that is? That's an impossible circumstance. Amen. That's impossible right there. The king says, listen, you're going to die unless you tell me what I dreamed. They said, okay, king, maybe you didn't hear us the first time. We can't tell you that, but we'll tell you the interpretation for sure. And he says, in essence, maybe you didn't hear me. All right? I don't usually repeat myself, gentlemen, so I'll, for your sake, I'll repeat myself. All right? If you don't tell me, you will all die. And they said, king, there is no one on earth that can do this. Daniel chapter 2, verse 11, and it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. These men were completely right and completely wrong at the same time. They were right that there is a God who can do this, but he's not one of the gods. He is the God. His dwelling is not with, with flesh, but his son became flesh for us. They were right, but wrong at the same time. And the king had an unthinkable request. There may be times in our lives when we hit these circumstances that are impossible, where the request seems to be impossible. A rare thing. No doubt these men had never been asked this before. And according to verse 12, would never be asked this again. Verse 12, the king says, For this cause the king was angry. And very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. There was, the king had a, a natural, unsaved response. He said, Fine, I'm angry, I'm furious, forget you, you're all going to die because you can't tell me what my dream is. Many of you have probably heard of or maybe watched the show called Jeopardy, right? In Jeopardy, you ask for different categories. I'll take history for 100, and I'll take math for 200, or cities of the U.S. at 300. This one I'll classify, I'll take overreactions for 1,000 right here. I, you can't tell me my dream, so I will destroy every wise person in Babylon. Now, throughout the book of Daniel, there's another message I preach on the anger of, the, of, of, a, of a king. These kings have a, have a history of becoming angry and destroying everything they need for later on. They're very short-sighted. If you destroy every wise person in Babylon, where are you going to get any counsel from? You see, he's not thinking clearly, all right? And he makes this response, it's unreasonable, you're trying to trick me, you're done. This is an impossible circumstance. There's no way for these men to be mind readers, no way to get an answer, no way that we can possibly have a solution. And the only alternative is death. The only alternative is death. Hey, there is no other way to get out of this thing. This would look like a problem, would it not? This would look like it's going to be the end of Daniel and his three friends. This would look like this circumstance is, is going to be a big deal. But can I, can I submit something? You know what this circumstance is? You know what this request is? If we can relate it to softball, it's a soft pitch. It's a soft pitch like this, underhand, so that the creator of the universe, God Almighty, can knock it right out of the park. This is not a hard thing for God now, is it? No, of course, it's hard for him. It's hard for you and me if we were in this situation. But it's not hard for him. 
It, this looks impossible, but what is this? Just a nice, easy, easy little pitch to the God of the universe so he can crank it out of the park. You ever been to a baseball game before? You seen a home run before? Man, when one of those guys, one of those men in a baseball game get a hold of that ball, it seems to just have its own set of wings. And you see hit after hit or strike after strike, and all of a sudden, somebody gets a hold of that ball, and it just soars out of there. Wow. 300, 360, 400 feet. Hitting the upper level of deck. You're like, man, that guy got a hold of that ball. He crushed that ball. That ball stood no chance against that hitter. In this circumstance, stands no chance against Daniel's God. Amen. You see, in your life and my life, there are going to be times when we will be in impossible situations. Not just hard situations. Not just difficult situations. All right, that was Daniel chapter 1. That was hard and difficult. Daniel then had to make a choice to do what was right. This one, this is different because it's impossible. There is no solution on earth that we could possibly imagine. Daniel can't change his diet. Daniel can't go into Neverland and dream the dreams. Daniel has no choice but to trust his God. I'd encourage you this morning in your life when you hit an impossible circumstance to make sure you zoom out. What do you mean by zoom out, Pastor Howell? Well, maybe... You've used on your smartphone Google Maps before. Google Maps is a wonderful invention. It can get you more lost than you already were. And you follow it blindly right into the brink of disaster. Sometimes when you're trying to find your spot, you, on Google Maps you can zoom in with your fingers, right? If you're not sure where you're at, you can zoom out. You can zoom out. And when you see the whole thing, oh, that's where I am. That's how it looks. You see, in this circumstance, which here looks big, looks impossible, zoom out. Look at it from God's perspective. This is nothing. This is nothing. Then I see this morning the appeal of Daniel. This morning I want to look at this in verses 14. We read it verse 14 to 18 if we could. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. To Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Arioch, why do we have to die so soon? Why is the king so angry? Why is he so upset? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. The appeal of Daniel went, first of all, to the king. He had asked Ariok, hey, Ariok, the captain of the guard, well, what's the problem here? And as he heard about it, he said, listen, I need to go talk to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar is angry. He's furious. He wants all the wise men killed. And now some wise guy walks into his throne room. Daniel, what do you want? O oh, king, O oh, king, live forever. King, make a request for you. Can I have a little bit of time? Now, the king was still not happy, right? All right, now we can't see what his conversation with Daniel, but he's, he's angry, he's furious. The Bible tells us that in verse number 12. But Daniel asked for some time. What a bold request! A bold request. I need some time, and king, I will show you this dream. Why could Daniel have that confidence? Why could Daniel go in? Was he just making a plea for his life? Oh, no, that's not all. That was part of it. We'll look at that. That's what the Bible tells That's part of it. But that's not all. You know why Daniel could have that confidence? To say, King, give me a little bit of time. I will show you the interpretation. I'll show you the dream. You will know what it is. Because Daniel believed God. You know why? Because Daniel believed God. God. And this impossible circumstance was nothing for Daniel's God. Verse 17, Daniel did what believers do. Then he went to his house, 
And he made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. Can you imagine that conversation? A little bit of urgency in that conversation. A little bit of fear and trepidation in that conversation. Listen, boys, we got our job cut out for us right now. What have you done, Daniel? Well, I was just talking to the king. We were supposed to die, but we're not going to die. I promised him that we'd tell him that I'd tell him the interpretation of the dream. You promised him what? Hey, Daniel, you said what? In verse number 18, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. You see that? Daniel and his friends were praying for their lives. They said, Lord, we don't want to die yet. Uh, Lord, life is short. Can we not make it any shorter today? You see, that, they're praying for their lives right here. It is a matter of life and death. And they get back there and Daniel says, listen, I promised this to the king. Now, boys, let's get on our knees and begin to pray. Pray to the God of the universe. Pray to our God who is the, the, the holder of secrets. And this secret that he'll make known to us. Urgency in prayer, a matter of life and death. This morning I want to end with this thought. So we look at Daniel and his belief in God. Daniel was a believer of God all the way through. He was not just a flaky believer. Can I say that? He was not just flavored as a believer of God. He was a true believer. You don't put your neck on the line like that before the most powerful king in all of the world at that time, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, without some belief in your God, without a genuine belief in your God. And Christian, this morning I would challenge you to be a belief-filled believer. There's a man who was shopping at a grocery store. Came across a bottle of juice bottle of juice was blueberry pomegranate, 100% juice, all natural. He said the label featured a picture of ripe pomegranates and mounds of fat, perfect blueberries. And then I read the ingredient list. Filtered water, pear juice concentrate, apple juice concentrate, grape juice concentrate, where was the blueberry? Where was the pomegranate? Finally, fifth and seventh on a list of nine ingredients. Now, by law, food ingredients are listed in descending order of weight inside of the product. That means a product with the greatest proportion of ingredient will be first and successively last. So in this bottle of blueberry, pomegranate, 100% juice, all natural... It was mostly water, and pear, and apple juice. And there, in the very bottom corner of this jar of juice, it said flavored juice blended with other natural ingredients. The question I have for you this morning, myself this morning, is if someone were to look at our life, we claim to believe God. That would be our packaging, if I can. I'm a believer. I believe God. How much? A hundred percent. Would we not claim that packaging? Would we not claim that label? Would we not say, yes, sir, pastor, that's me, to our coworkers, to our bosses, I believe God. I'll stand in faith. But if someone were to look at the ingredients in our life, of our decisions, what would come first? Would they find self, worry, fear? And at the very bottom, God. And in small type, belief in God mixed with other natural tendencies. What I'm asking this morning, are we God-flavored or God-filled? Are we God-flavored or God-filled? Because I look at Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and I see God-filled 
men. Not just God-flavored men. This morning, I challenge you to be God-filled. Those words, I believe God, would not just be our packaging, but they would be our ingredient list. Like we were for those men. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this example of Daniel and his three friends, Lord. Lord, their belief in you was evident by the stands they took. And Lord, I know in the face of impossible circumstances, it was nothing for you. Lord, I pray this morning there may be someone here who's facing something difficult in life, who doesn't know which way to turn. Lord, I pray that their belief in you would be their essence. I wonder if this morning you're here, and as we were speaking, if God spoke to you. He said, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't want to be God-flavored. I want to be God-filled. I don't want to have just God on one of the ingredients that make up my life. I want him to be my life, and in all things he might have the preeminence, as Paul said. I would say, Pastor, would you pray for me this morning? That I would be God-filled. Would you slip your hand up? I'd love to pray for you this morning. Amen. 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 Hands all over. I wonder if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I wonder this morning if you're here and you don't know that you'd go to heaven for sure. Well, the Bible says you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. It is nothing that we can do. It's not by our works or our righteousness, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's nothing that we can do to keep our salvation. It's all in the, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you're here this morning. If you died today, you don't know that you have a home in heaven. Could I pray for you when I pray for the others? I would say, Pastor Howell, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll call no more attention to you than I did anyone else. But would you slip your hand up and say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I see that. And who else? I'm not sure I'm saved. I'd like to be. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? Amen. I see that. Anyone else? That's me this morning. Lord, you've seen these hands, those who want to follow you in salvation, Lord, those who want to follow you in faith. Lord, may their, our hearts be turned towards you and may their decisions be clear for you. May we have the strength that we need in Jesus' name.